I hope I'll explain what those words mean by the end of my talk. I have to admit that the number of, uh, that number of slides I have uh, ratio to the number of minutes exceeds what I normally can manage. So uh, first thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank uh, Jairo and Karen for the opportunity to come here. I think it's, uh, uh, I always think of it as an accomplishment that my former postdocs still tolerate having me around, so thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, a property of uh, uh, um, uh, graphene, uh, uh, basically two-dimensional materials illustrated by the example of graphene. And this is uh, what I'm, the new part of what I'm going to talk about is based on work by postdoc and my group Dmitry Effenkin and based on earlier work by Ashley De Silva and Rafi Bistritzer. And it's, uh, as I'll explain, it's a problem I keep coming back to. Uh, and I keep coming back to it mainly because of my experimental colleague, Emmanuel Tutuk, and his uh, friend and collaborator, Brian Leroy from the University of Arizona, uh, who keep showing me interesting data I don't understand. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, my talk is uh, connected to the topological in the title of this workshop, uh, workshop in the sense that it's connected to uh, quantum valley hall effect in bilayer graphene systems. Uh, and <clears throat> it's also connected to moray patterns. And uh, what I'm going to explain is how those two things together uh, uh, give you a, uh, a chiral uh, network of, uh, a network of chiral states. And let me start here. This uh, thing I ran across recently, which I like very much, is a, um, a, um, a a memorial uh, or a uh, uh, about uh, Joaquin uh, Luttinger, uh, uh, written by Walter Cohn. You can find this on the web. Uh, was one thing that surprised me about this is I always thought Joaquin was a Spanish name, but uh, uh, Mr. Luttinger actually comes from a Lat Latvian family. Uh, and uh, so Luttinger uh, is a name we've uh, most of us run across uh, in physics. He's done. Uh, many important things, and uh, uh, the one that's related to this talk is perhaps not the most important thing he did, but it's, uh, it was a, a piece of work that he did when he was doing fundamental work at that time about transport theory in crystals and semiconductors in particular, uh, together with Walter Cohn, and he was visiting UC Berkeley and learned about the anomalous Hall effect, Hall effect due to broken time reversal symmetry in ferromagnetic materials. And he came up with uh, this explanation for the anomalous Hall effect in terms of this quantity, which uh, in his transport theory is an extra electron that uh, block states accumulate uh, perpendicular to the direction of uh, an electric field. And if you add up all of those for a band, you can get a Hall current, and that was his theory of the uh, of the anomalous Hall effect, which was in subsequent years more or less for uh, uh, more or less discounted. And um, uh, perhaps it was the ultimately the discovery, experimental discovery of the quantum Hall effect, which brought people's uh, attention back to this idea as something relevant to the anomalous Hall effect in ferromagnetic materials. Here's the, exper uh, the uh, expression that I showed you just a moment ago from Luttinger for the extra velocity of, uh, of uh, electrons in a crystal in a magnetic field that comes actually from band mixing effects of the electric field, the same kinds of effects that give a dielectric constant uh, in uh, an insulator uh, give this extra anomalous velocity. And uh, uh, motivated by the experimental discovery of the quantum Hall effect, uh, Thales and collaborators in the early 80s wrote down this famous expression. And expression, it's a 2D version of the same expression. It's basically, uh, it's the same thing, adding up all of these Luttinger's anomalous velocities uh, in a band uh, uh, and uh, interpreting it as a Hall effect. Uh, interestingly, Luttinger's paper is not cited in this paper by Thales. I'm not sure if they were aware of it or uh, uh, it had uh, uh, fallen deep into darkness in people's memory. But uh, the interesting thing, of course, in two dimensions is we know that this thing here, uh, 
which has got to do with an integral over two-dimensional wave vector space of how the block state wave function changes with wave vector is actually a topological invariant. And of course, this is the first work which provided a topological classification of, of block bands. Um, uh, um, okay. So that's going to be related to my talk. And so my talk is also about graphene and it's about these states near the Fermi level of graphene sheets, uh, which are states near the Bruin zone corners as, uh, uh, as um, most of you know of these honeycomb lattices of carbon atoms. And they're described by a uh, two-dimensional Dirac equation, uh, the energy, uh, uh, these two uh, bands that are present near the Fermi energy, the splitting between them vanishes at the Bruin zone corner and if we measure momentum from the Bruin zone corner then, uh, uh, <coughs> um, then the Hamiltonian is, can be written in this uh, form, k dot tau, where tau is a pseudospin constructed from this honeycomb sublattices. So this will uh, all be important in my talk. And so the Hamiltonian actually uh, uh, accounts for the splitting of the pi bands and graphene due to hopping between uh, one sublattice and another, which in a single isolated sheet uh, exactly cancels uh, at the Bruin zone corners. Okay? And <coughs> um, so I'm going to be talking about graphene bilayers, actually the, the uh, quantum valley hall effect in graphene bilayers and moray patterns produced in graphene bilayers. And so we're interested in two copies of, <coughs> uh, of, of graphene. Uh, here's, this is the Hamiltonian uh, I just uh, explained for momenta near the Bruin zone corner of an isolated graphene sheet, say the top layer, where K here is uh, a two-dimensional momentum written as a complex number. Importantly, the phase of this off-diagonal, this hopping uh, element depends on the direction of momentum. And, um, uh, and you'll notice here uh, that I've allowed the energy of pi electrons on the two layers to be shifted relative to each other, which is easy to do with the gates. And, uh, uh, and w uh, the main thing I'm going to talk about today is, is involves um, having a non-zero value for this potential difference, which people often characterize as a displacement field. Okay. Okay. So the next thing I want to say, uh, which is important for what I'm going to get to, is that the electronic structure of multi-layers of graphene, graphite, or in this simplest case, two layers of graphene, depends very much on how the two layers are stacked one on top of each other. And uh, so I'm just going to give uh, I give a few examples of that. So this is, uh, this is two layers of graphene and this is all well known uh, to uh, people in, uh, who've uh, followed the graphene literature and perhaps first emphasized by McCann, Falco and uh, others. Uh, and <coughs> so this is uh, top layer, bottom layer, but now I've allowed tunneling between the layers. So this two by two matrix here uh, is <coughs> capturing momentum dependent uh, um, uh, momentum dependent and sublattice dependent tunneling from one layer to the other. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the two components on the top are the two sublattices on the top, the two components on the bottom are the two sublattices on the bottom. So this represents uh, a case where uh, the A sublattice on the top layer is on top of the B sublattice on the bottom layer. So uh, there's interlayer tunneling between those two and that, uh, that gives this, uh, this um, uh, sublattice dependent form of sublattice independent interlayer tunneling where only uh, B bottom to A top tunneling can occur. Okay? So this is a simple model for AB stack uh, Bernal, AB Bernal stack bilayer graphene. And uh, <clears throat> so what happens basically is that this interlayer tunneling pushes two of the states away from the Fermi level uh, by uh, a lot, we'll say. And uh, so there's two remote bands that don't matter anymore. And if you look at now at the tunneling from the uh, available 
sublattice states in the top layer to the bottom layer, it has to proceed, at least in this model, via these, uh, uh, via these high energy states and it occurs uh, virtually in a second order process. So you end up with a effective, uh, uh, effective two band model for the states near the Fermi level in this AB stacked Bernal bilayer graphene. And <clears throat> there are two remarks I want to make about it. First of all, you can easily see that uh, at zero momentum, that's at the Bruin zone corners, if you put a bias voltage, you open a gap. Okay, so uh, this is a, a very cool system in that you can very easily electrically open up a band gap. And so that means if you go to very large K, if I represent this, um, uh, the eigenstates of this 2 by 2 Hamiltonian by a pseudospin, then the off-diagonal effective magnetic field is uh, very much stronger eventually at large K than the diagonal part. And that means that the uh, pseudospinner that describes the states is uh, halfway between in this block sphere representation, half top, half bottom, and it's on this uh, equatorial plane of the block sphere. And uh, because this K is a complex number, it, uh, it actually, when you go around a circle in K space, it encloses that block sphere uh, twice, okay? Uh, and so if I uh, apply David Thales's recipe and calculate the Hall conductivity by integrating uh, this Berry curvature uh, over the valence band, it turns out uh, in the case of these two-level systems, we can uh, uh, map it to area on the block sphere. And what happens is uh, at k equals zero, depending on the sign of the bias voltage, you're either in top layer or bottom layer. And uh, as you integrate over k, uh, you circle around, uh, going around circles in momentum space, you go around the sphere uh, twice. And so you cover the top of the sphere once, uh, sorry, the top half of the sphere twice and that gives you a Hall conductivity which is uh, e, e squared over h, a quantum Hall conductivity. And uh, this is a quantum Hall conductivity coming from states only near one of the two valleys in momentum space. Of course to have a, a Hall conductivity you need to break time reversal symmetry and in this case the opposite valley will have the opposite sign of Hall conductivity and that, that's why this uh, is called a valley Hall conductivity. Uh, okay, so um, uh, this is BA stacking, everything's the same except it turns out that for uh, a given sign of, uh, of the displacement field which makes a potential difference between the two layers, if you go through the same argument then the uh, direction in which the pseudo spinners go around the block sphere changes and the Hall conductivity there, therefore changes sign. So. Uh, uh, these simple considerations say that if you have a uh, domain wall between an AB region and a BA region, you're changing the Hall conduct sign of the Hall conductivity, quantized Hall conductivity uh, from each uh, region and therefore uh, normally we expect boundary states associated with that and th those are the boundary states I'm going to be talking about. Uh, <coughs> indeed, um, uh, there, uh, these boundary states have been seen experimentally, for example, in this uh, clever experiment from Fang Wang at uh, UC Berkeley who uh, uses uh, a near field uh, technique to uh, find the domain walls uh, uh, in the system and then uh, uh, does a lithography to uh, make contact to them and do, uh, does electrical measurements and he can show that there's ballistic transport along these chiral domain walls, one-way domain walls in a given valley uh, uh, that exist along these edge states that uh, travel for uh, half a micron or so. How big are your samples, Lawrence? Bigger? Uh, yeah, bigger, bigger. Bigger, okay, but, but you know, in the micron range. So it's nearly, nearly uh, very similar to the non-local transport phenomena that uh, uh, Lawrence uh, has uh, been studying. Okay, uh, <coughs> uh, finally let me mention the case of AA stacking. So this is two honeycombs right on top of each other. Then the uh, tunneling between the uh, layers is sublattice independent in this case. Uh, 
And then it turns out that the uh, sublattice dependence and the layer dependence in this Hamiltonian separate and you end up with just two Dirac cones. So at the AA, if you have AA stacking, a, bi, uh, a, a displacement field will not make an energy gap. Okay. Okay, so that's background. We'll see how that appears when you form more A patterns in bilayer graphene. And how am I doing on time, boss? 15 minutes. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so more A patterns. I think most of you have heard about more A patterns, but let me. Uh, say something general uh, just in case. Uh, so uh, <coughs> um, I'm given to understand by my thorough research, which means I looked up the Wikipedia article, uh, that uh, the word for more is actually connected to the English word for uh, the wool produced by this very handsome looking uh, sheep, and, uh, th which is called mohair. Uh, and I'm not sure what the German word is. Do you, anybody know? Okay. Uh, more <laughs> mohair, okay. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, <coughs> and so this word was an English word at some point uh, in history. Mohair, it uh, uh, went over to French and accumulated an accent and then came back to English in this form, and so that's what more is. It's not anybody's name, as I thought originally. And uh, it, uh, um, you know, it's a very generic kind of phenomena, refers to any kind of pattern form when you overlay two uh, regular structures in two dimensions, for example, two concentric circles. Uh, if you overlay one on top of the other with a displacement, they produce uh, interesting patterns like you see here. Uh, but the moray patterns, another way to make moray patterns is to place two uh, periodic structures on top of each other and obviously the periodic structures we're interested in are two uh, honeycomb lattices of carbon atoms and uh, <coughs> this probably won't um, so uh, uh, you've probably all seen this before but what we have there is two honeycombs one on top of each other and uh, if you uh, if you uh, rotate them, uh, then <coughs> uh, originally uh, all of the honeycombs are open, uh, but as you rotate them, you can see uh, that for small rotation angles, uh, uh, the um, uh, relative uh, configuration of one layer with respect to the other uh, changes smoothly in space so that you locally have AA stacking, like this is uh, AA stacking everywhere. And, but if I start to rotate it, then I'm going to get places where I have AB stacking and so on. And when the rotation angle is very small, then the uh, stacking pattern changes very slowly in space and the regions that you can see most prominently there when you have a, or when you have, uh, are the AA regions and um, uh, they get uh, further and further apart as the stacking angle gets close to zero degrees or 60 degrees, okay? So we can make patterns, periodic patterns, in these bilayer graphene systems and it turns out, you know, people try to make have been trying to make artificial periodic patterns in materials with all kinds of different motivations, uh, success more or less successfully or unsuccessfully depending on your purposes. But this is one of the most successful ways of making periodic patterns uh, in materials. And my colleague, as I mentioned earlier, Emmanuel Tutuk, has been working very hard on uh, 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 trying to get good at making nearly perfect uh, small twist angles of one graphene sheet relative to another, uh, which he does with uh, uh, basically some uh, pick up and release technique where he takes a graphene sheet cuts it in two, picks up half of it, uh, and then uh, twists it by a controlled amount and drops that half somewhere else. Okay, so he's, uh, he, or as he always tells me to be uh, more accurate, his students are very good at this. And uh, <coughs> so they've been doing this kind of thing, making graphene sheets uh, um, with very small rotation angles, which means very long period more patterns uh, exceeding uh, 10 or even 20 nanometers. And <clears throat> um, so uh, when you take um, 
If you have two graphene sheets on top of each other, everything I told you at the beginning, I didn't say so, uh, but <coughs> uh, uh, where I had a Hamiltonian that depends on momentum, I can only do that if I have a crystal. And if these, once I take one layer and twist it relative to the other, ge generically speaking, it's not a crystal any longer. Okay? Uh, and and uh, <coughs> the momentum space of one layer twists relative to, a, to the other. And so that's the situation in which we're interested in the electronic structure. Uh, and <coughs> um, and uh, uh, the way I think about this problem is based on some work that uh, uh, Rafi Bistritzer did a number of years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, he derived this simple model for describing uh, tunneling between the two systems. And uh, <coughs> what it is, is that there's an interlayer tunneling amplitude that is, has indices here, and those are sublattice. So sublattice dependent interlayer tunneling. So everything is viewed as position dependent, sublattice, de uh, position dependent and sublattice dependent interlayer tunneling. And the position dependence has the period of the Moray pattern. And, uh, uh, and it's uh, fairly simple with an approximation that I, uh, I, um, whose spirit I will briefly describe to derive a very simple one parameter expression for uh, the tunneling between these bilayers, which uh, uh, depends on uh, totally independent of rotation angle, so it's uh, one parameter for all cases. And um, <coughs> the spirit of it is, uh, uh, you know, so actually the derivation assumes that uh, there's some hopping from one layer, uh, hopping from pi orbitals in one layer to the other that depends on three-dimensional distance. And, uh, uh, and <coughs> uh, basically because the distance between the layers in these van der Waals coupler materials is considerably larger than the distance between atoms within a layer, when you look from one layer to the other, it looks like the atoms are very close together in the other layer. And uh, it just sees it as a continuum. And this is actually a calculation with some approximations of, uh, uh, of uh, in effect, this is uh, some hopping amplitude, effective hopping amplitude as a function of 2D momentum. And the biggest Q, one over this biggest Q is the shortest distance, you know, you can resolve on the other side. And uh, basically, uh, uh, um, the one parameter theory uh, includes a phenomenological number which is one Fourier transform of this hopping amplitude. And in this formulation, the next one that enters is down by a um, couple of orders of magnitude, maybe. Okay. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, uh, I said this is um, position dependent tunneling. And when I do that, I'm working in a representation where I measure momentum in each layer from the Dirac point of that layer, okay? And so uh, <coughs> the uh, hopping processes, because I've shifted momentum in one layer relative to the other, it turns out that hopping from one layer to another in this representation gives a momentum boost. And, uh, uh, and so you, w one place in momentum space is coupled to some network of points in momentum space uh, and um, uh, the hopping amplitude is sublattice dependent, but it's periodic, so you can use Bloch's theorem in the usual way. Okay. Okay. So, <coughs> uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about in my remaining how many minutes? Five minutes. Five, five minutes. Maybe six or seven. <laughs> uh, uh, is uh, some motivated by some recent exper uh, experiments by my colleagues. I'll, I have permission to show you. Uh, and um, uh, it's in the case where there is a electric potential difference between the two layers, a displacement field, if you like, that's actually fairly large. And so this is the case I said in which, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I f so first of all, let me start uh, by ignoring tunneling between the layers, even though they're only they're not separated by any vacuum, only by this Van der Waals region. 
So in the decouple layers, I have a Dirac cone for the top layer, Dirac cone for the bottom layer, and uh, um, uh, I'm going to concentrate on the case where the system is overall neutral. So that means the Fermi level lies here where there's just as many electrons added to one layer as there are uh, removed from the other layer. Okay? And so in that case, uh, uh, non-interacting electrons and um, uh, uh, ignoring tunneling, I have two coincident Fermi surfaces, right? I have a, this Fermi surface with occupied states inside, empty states outside, let's call it conduction band, and this Fermi surface with empty states inside and occupied states outside. And <coughs> um, so this is, this is, uh, uh, this is the um, decoupled uh, bilayer electronic structure, it's pretty clear that uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have a gap, I'm going to create a gap due to interlayer tunneling provided the tunneling amplitude at the Fermi level never vanishes. So let's ask ourselves the question, when does the tunneling amplitude at the Fermi level vanish? And let me talk about this first in this uh, position dependent tunneling model or approximation and I'm going to make kind of a local density approximation and uh, uh, consider the tunneling uh, to be uh, the electronic structure locally at a given position is defined by the tunnel interlayer tunneling amplitude at that position and when that local approximation is valid I don't have time to talk about but it turns out that uh, this tunneling am to amplitude between the layers that I that uh, Rafi Bistritzer evolved has diagonal terms that are identical, and th this, these diagonal terms are sublattice independent tunneling. And we're tunneling from a conduction band to a valence band, those states are orthogonal to each other, so they don't contribute to the mixing of the states of these two states on these two Fermi surfaces. Uh, instead, just the off diagonal tunneling does, which is a complex number. And it's, uh, it turns out that you can easily see that because of the chiral or the properties of these block states that I mentioned before, these uh, matrix elements go like e to the i orientation times orientation angle in momentum space. And uh, so there will be, if uh, this will vanish at some orientation on the Fermi surface, provided the amplitude of TAB, TBA, that means from A in the bottom layer to B on the top is equal to the amplitude of TAB. And we can ask ourselves, uh, where does that happen? Uh, the minimum, that size of that determines the size of the gap. And uh, here's a map of space. Uh, this is the uh, 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 a minimum going around the Fermi surface, the minimum gap. Uh, these are actually locally AA points at these vertices. Uh, these, this is an AB point, this is a BA point. I have a gap at this AB point, gap at this BA point. I have uh, no gap uh, at the AA points, as I mentioned before when I talked about uh, those three special cases. But it turns out that everywhere on the line connecting these, then, uh, then locally I have uh, no gap. And so it's locally in real space or momentum? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, locally, uh, this is a real space picture. This is a real space picture and uh, in a local density approximation, the gap uh, goes to zero at the very uh, bluest points, okay? Angle is small, right? So the more, more, angle is small. Say that again? The angle, the... Uh, uh, so, uh, the yeah, so... This is all universal, uh, but um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the basic model, uh, this continual model of, for the interlayer tunneling works below about two degrees. And the local density approximation that I'm employing here is, uh, becomes valid by a different criterion and Emmanuel and uh, 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 Brian, uh, our Manuel Tutuk and Brian Leroy are now making a twist angle small enough that they're getting into the regime where this local density approximation is actually relevant, below about a half a degree maybe. Okay, so this is local gap, 
uh, uh, going to zero. And uh, so it turns out every, along every line connecting the AA points, uh, the local gap goes to zero. If I look at that in a little more detail, uh, I, I, you can show that everywhere along this line, this is the line from, uh, this, is, uh, uh, um, this is position in this direction, this is energy in this direction, this is just going along this line like that in this uh, space. And uh, I'm uh, running short of time as predicted. And uh, so um, uh, um, let me just say that uh, there are states uh, that uh, <coughs> the gap vanishes everywhere along this uh, lines connecting AA points. And uh, uh, at the AA uh, points themselves, actually, the density state, local density states, is finite at all energy. So, um, uh, so um, this is um, uh, some uh, recent uh, measurements by Brian Leroy in the regime I've been talking about. A small twist angle, uh, uh, double bi uh, bilayer graphene with a um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, with a small twist angle. This is looking at the tunneling density of states as a function of position at low energies, light here is a big tunneling density of states. This says that there's uh, more density of states near the AA points, but there's uh, also low energy states in these on-gapped regions uh, along the lines uh, connecting the AA points, this network of points at 120 degrees to each other. And I won't comment on this, but they also see features uh, at high energies, which we can understand from the same model. And in terms of the uh, low energy uh, electronic structure, uh, then <coughs> it turns out that you can derive an effective model, which uh, may require some elaboration very close to the AA points. But basically, the states that exist at low energies move along these lines connecting AA points. And uh, <coughs> um, they can only move in one direction in a given valley. This is basically the domain wall between AB and BA uh, uh, um, uh, regions that I mentioned before, which gives these topologically protected chiral edge modes associated with the valley Hall effect. And when they get to these intersections, the outgoing directions, a given guy coming in, can go out in three different directions. Uh, can either go straight ahead or can tune at one uh, ten, uh, you know, can uh, twist by 120 uh, degrees uh, either way. And it turns out that the electronic structure of this system, as uh, uh, Dmitry Effenken has uh, shown in a very nice calculation, depends on a single parameter that is uh, calculable, actually and uh, <coughs> uh, gives this uh, interesting pattern in the low energy density of states uh, that uh, 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 this uh, uh, kind of model is very close to a realization of models that people often used in, uh, as toy models for uh, uh, quantum Hall effect. And so it may be possible to do transports on uh, real network models uh, of, uh, so associated with the quantum Hall effect. And the chair has uh, stood up, so I'm not going to mention this one point. Let me just say that all of this gets much more complicated if you don't have a displacement field between the two layers. And there are many at things that we calculate from this model that we don't understand, that seem like they should have an inter a simple explanation, but we can't uh, figure it out. And also, experiments that Brian has done, uh, published earlier this year in PNAS, uh, at, uh, without a displacement field, the more complicated situation, show that there are very strong many-body effects in these systems. Once, once you get to small twist angles, probably associated with Hubbard-like correlations associated with the states near these AA points, and they're interesting things in magnetic fields. I'll just leave you with this uh, summary slide. Thanks very much.